Well, good evening, everyone. Buonasera. Thank you for your patience. Um, and thank you for coming to tonight's conversation, Making the Past, Perspectives on Keeping and Letting Go. I'm Elizabeth Rodini, Director of the American Academy in Rome, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you tonight and to host this evening's conversation. I'm going to get re-miked. Thank you. Between Claire Lyons and Weber and Doro in a program affiliated with our current exhibition, Regeneration. This is the final episode of our series of conversations set this year around the theme of ethics. And I thank the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation whose generosity makes this series possible. I'm also grateful for the support of our neighbors down the hill, ECROM, and to our staff here, and in particular to my colleague and exhibition co-curator, Andrew High School Arts Director, Lindsay Harris. Before moving to the introductions of our speakers, I want to share with you the brief story of a shoe, yes, a shoe, a very special shoe. Uh, a few years ago in Auckland, Norway, a hiker spotted something sticking out of the snow. It turned out to be, not this, but a leather sandal of a style akin to the ancient Roman carbaton, dated by radiocarbon methods to 300 CE, a rare and very exciting find. The recovery of this shoe, preserved for centuries by the ice, is also something of a paradox. On the one hand, rising temperatures and melting snow permitted its discovery. On the other hand, those same conditions allow the flourishing of microbes that reduce organic materials like leather to rot. Artifacts like this appear and then are immediately at risk of disintegrating and disappearing forever. So Arctic archaeologists are faced with a dilemma of some urgency. As the planet continues to warm and reveal long frozen sites, which will they prioritize for excavation and which will they choose to let go? The serendipity of survival is complicated by human interventions that preserve, protect, erode, or erase, whether intentionally or not. These themes percolate through our current exhibition, Regeneration, on view in our gallery upstairs. They also cut through the work of tonight's panelists in provocative and important ways. Claire Lyons is an archaeologist specializing in the ancient Mediterranean and works as a museum curator. Weber Ndoro's archaeological research centers on sub-Saharan Africa, and his current professional activity lies in heritage management. Together, these experts offer us a chance to think transhistorically and cross-culturally about what we choose to preserve, how, and why. Let me introduce them both to you now in some detail, and then we will hear from each of them before moving on to some conversation and some questions. We begin tonight with Claire Lyons, who is curator in the Department of Antiquities at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles, and is in Rome as the Academy's Esther Van Diemen Scholar in Residence. A specialist in pre-Roman Italy, Etruria, and Magna Graecia, Dr. Lyons has been at the Getty since 1995. Her curatorial projects, which center on the afterlife of antiquity in the visual arts and culture, the history of collecting, and antiquities in social contexts, both ancient and modern, include Sicily, Art and Invention Between Greece and Rome, organized with Alexandra Sofraniou in 2013, and the Aztec Pantheon and Art of Empire, curated with John Pohl in 2010. Of particular relevance to us tonight was her exhibition out of the Getty Research Institute's Special Collections Library entitled Irresistible Decay, and the related publication with Michael Roth and Charles Merriweather, subtitled Ruins Reclaimed. Great fodder for her presentation and our conversation. Dr. Lyons has also written about the early cemeteries at Morgantina in Sicily and has co-edited volumes on Greek colonialism and on gender and sexuality in Greek and Roman art. Among these books are Naked Truths, Women, Sexuality, and Gender in Classical Art and Archaeology from 2000 and The Arche Archaeology of Colonialism from 2002. At the Academy, she is completing a catalog of the Getty's significant collection of Etruscan and Italic art, spanning the 9th to the 1st centuries BCE and covering all media. That sounds like quite an undertaking. We will then turn to Weber Ndoro, who was confirmed Director General of ECROM in 2017. ECROM is the International Center for the Study of Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property based here in Rome, and we will learn more about its important work tonight. 
Dr. Ndoro's involvement with ECROM began in 1998 when he was tasked with implementing one of the first three site projects for the Africa 2009 program. He worked for ICRAM, bringing an important and necessary African perspective to its work, until 2007, when he left, temporarily as it turned out, to become executive director of the African World Heritage Fund, which he developed into one of the leading conservation organizations in the region. There he implemented programs and activities for heritage conservation aimed at improving world heritage nominations, strengthened disaster risk management and traditional management systems, and promoted entrepreneurship related to local heritage. Previously, Dr. Ndoro worked for the National Museums and Monuments of Zimbabwe, where he was co-coordinator of its monuments program. He has lectured on heritage management at the University of Zimbabwe, the University of Bergen in Norway, and the University of Cape Town, South Africa, where he is honorary professor. Dr. Ndoro's accomplishments in the field of heritage conservation have had a lasting impact on ECROM as an organization and on a generation of young heritage professionals in sub-Saharan Africa and worldwide, and I am very honored and grateful to have him join us tonight. So with that, let's begin with Claire Lyons. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for the kind introduction and especially for the very much welcome invitation to spend time at the Academy with all of you. In the exhibition that you and Lindsay curated, the artists explore fragmentation under the rubric of regeneration, which implies a rebirth and a kind of salvation. For my part, I'd like to first consider some early episodes of restoration, and then a brief reading of how disintegrating monuments are mediated in visual culture. This theme cuts a wide through line through the, across the Getty's collections of prints, drawings, and photography, as well as exhibitions such as the one you mentioned with the irresistible title of Irresistible Decay, which is something that we uh, curators organized together with our former director, Salvatore Settis, who's one of the really great um, scholars of this subject. Historical illustrations, thirdly, highlight some of the dilemmas of saving cultural heritage. And on that, we're going to hear more from Weber and Doro's global perspectives. So we have our first slide. We consider ruins primarily as monumental structures that however dilapidated and overtaken by encroaching nature still retain a quality of magnitude and are therefore intrinsically compelling. They elicit emotions ranging from nostalgia and despair to vicarious pleasure. In these vistas of isolated ancient temples at Capo Sunio and the Upper Nile Valley, decay, ironically, engenders feelings of the sublime, the fragility of human endeavors in the face of an awesome or hostile in natural environment. Destroyed monuments and artfully broken fragments sit at a crossroads of aesthetics, documentation, and ideology. And it's that tension that makes them ideal vehicles for allegory. Even as they admonish us against vanity and arrogance, ruins have been conscripted to validate our beliefs in ethnic roots and national identity. In the 16th century, the papal edicts that prohibited the dismantling of monuments are often identified as pioneering measures to protect ancient built heritage. Preservation, however, was mainly aimed to ensure the Vatican's strategic control over symbolic backdrops of Christian rituals. Ruins, nevertheless, were relentlessly despoiled for building materials and urban development. For restoration as policy, we actually need to look further back in time. Already in the first century Rome, the Emperor Augustus launched a program to refurbish some 82 antique temples, as he claimed, as an explicit return to traditional values. When the old temple of Athena Polios was destroyed by the Persians in 480 BC, it was likely remained for a time uh, as, an, as a burned relic on the Athenian Acropolis, a reminder 
for future generations of barbarian cruelty. And long before that, locations that were associated with mythical heroes were enshrined as ancestral sites of pilgrimage and were staged as tourist attractions. Places that appear to be palimpsests of organic decay were often consciously curated in ways that are strikingly modern. In the, in the course of building our collections, what especially interested me and all the curators are the meta-narratives that lie behind pictorial images and texts. This engraving belongs to a volume on Aegean ports that were key for the growing Dutch mercantile trade with the Levant. Delos was praised for its beauty by the fifth century poets Pindar and Callimachus. But by Conrad Decker's time, the island was mourned as a, quote, melancholy expanse of debris. At the center is a fragmentary sculpture of a kouros, a youth, which was progressively diminished as its limbs were chopped off and carried away, leaving behind just a faceless stump. Decker's regret for a vanishing past is a recurring literary trope. But while rival continental powers were often responsible for destructive greed, in the European imagination, images like this implicitly shifted the blame for negligence onto the local Ottoman Greek community. At first glance, Vaudoyer's watercolor trades on similar well-worn motifs in the rediscovery of antiquity. Remnants of ancient stones, here a fallen atlas figure from the Temple of Olympian Zeus in Agrigento, and lush vegetation under the gaze of European gentlemen. More than a voyage pittoresque, these student architects were on a rebellious mission. They had abandoned the conventional Beaux-Arts curriculum of drawing the majestic ruins of Roman engineering and Pompeian interior design. Instead, they studied the pre-Roman cultures of Magna Graecia and, in, and Etruria, which were amazingly still little known to Europeans privileging non-canonical structures, indigenous art forms, and anti-classical polychromatic decoration. This marked a turning point between romantic travel and systematic reconnaissance, made at a time when some rather progressive ideas about architectural preservation were emerging in Sicily and in France. At the very moment of its birth in 1839, photography entered into the service of archaeology. Portraits of classical statues and panoramas of crumbling monuments posed in timeless landscapes were its first subjects. Objects unseen for centuries came into view through a technological innovation that promised perfect clarity. Camera vision was incontrovertible and persuasive. It offered eyewitness views that are still essential for tracing the changing condition of buildings and urban landscapes over time. But objective documentation with the square quotes, scare, uh, scare quotes over the word objective, as we well know, relies on perspective, highlighting, and cropping, and so goes hand in hand with political image making. In the work of pioneer photographers, it's hard to separate the project of recuperation from the whole apparatus of military escorts, diplomats, commercial investors, and national museums, which made their challenging expeditions viable. As our collection expanded from the Greco-Roman regions to the Ottoman Empire, Africa, Asia, and Latin America, the reach of colonial and imperialist agendas surfaces in the foreground. This is none too subtle in Maudsley's view of the excavations at Palenque and in any number of Western missions to map, measure, cast, collect, and inventory the past. Photography also became operative at a time when identity and nation building increasingly pivoted on the tangible places of collective memory. There are countless examples, but let's consider one that's a little closer to home the salt prints of Stefano Lecchi, who was responsible for the earliest war reportage, focusing on the 1849 battles on the Janiculum Hill. 
Lecky equated ancient ruins with the destructions of modern warfare. Witnessed here in Garibaldi's damaged headquarters in the Casino Savorelli, now, of course, the beautifully restored Villa Aurelia. What's especially compelling about the album at the Getty is that the photographer inscribed it to an English visitor to galvanize support for the Italian cause. And he combines the battle series with views of the Roman Forum and Pompeii. Echo echoing Risorgimento poetry, ruins became a patriotic rallying point for the rehabilitation of modern Italy. By, by way of concluding, I want to turn to the irresistible allure of the fragment and to pause for a moment on a sculpture, one of the greatest of all fragments, that has played a significant role in the history of Rome. The sculpture in question preserves the four parts of a lion and the torso of a horse. The rest is 16th century. And it's the focus of my work during this residency. It's fair to say that no other ancient sculpture claims such a long and storied cultural biography. It's a Hellenistic Greek work and arguably might have been brought from the Eastern Mediterranean to Rome as a spoil of battle. In the medieval period, the emblem of predator and prey was on the steps of Rome's civic government, known as the Loco del Leone, where penal sentences were carried out. The lion stood for gran justicia, justice punishing misdeed, an apt metaphor for good governance. But after Pope Paul III Farnese donated the bronze wolf, suck suckling Romulus and Remus, to the Roman people in 1471, the lion and horse was eclipsed as the symbol of the city. Michelangelo, however, had praised the group as most marvelous and named it among the top sculptures to be seen in Rome along with another famous fragment, the Torso Belvedere. The mutilated animals were restored by one of his followers who added the horse's head and limbs and the lion's rear legs, not entirely successfully, in 1584. Thereafter, it took on new lives as a paradigm of artist drawings and paintings from the Renaissance pretty much all the way up to the present day. A couple years ago in uh, our Topanga Canyon neighbor, the artist Charles Ray realized a version in aluminum titled Mountain Lion Attacking a Dog, which, is, which was on display here and which is a reality for us in Los Angeles. In uh, 2012, the Capitoline sculpture underwent a full conservation treatment before coming on loan to the Getty Villa, and then finally assumed its rightful place among the other ancient art treasures in the Capitoline, etc. So as these few examples indicate, the traces of ruins and fragments rarely survive as uncomplicated residues. They persist as products of remembrance as much as neglect and forgetfulness and function as touchstones for the connections between past and present. Recent research on the archaeology of memory reminds us that reuse was ongoing and salvation, as it were, is cyclical, which calls into question our assumptions about origins and authenticity. The illustrations that I've touched very briefly on show that the ethical conundrums could be as old as the monuments themselves. It's not a stretch of the imagination to picture what was involved in Augustus's sweeping renovation of religious cult buildings or the refashioning of mythical destinations for tourism in the fourth century BC. So a few questions as uh, food for thought. How can we democratize the inclusion of diverse competing interests shared by communities and other stakeholders? When sustainability is an ever more pressing concern, what do we prioritize for preservation? For whom? To what degree? Or should we simply leave ruins to their own destiny? And how does one acknowledge the full life of objects and monuments and the multi-layered narratives that reside in them over the long durée? No doubt, new open source imaging and digital technologies can be brought to bear and will invite many different voices and stories, but choices are still going to have to be weighed. These issues are not easily resolved, and each case is going to demand tailored, if 
inevitably temporary approaches. So uh, perhaps this is an excellent moment for me to turn the questions <laughs> over to Weber, and uh, who has really given them a great deal of thought over the course of his career. Thank you very much. Here's my presentation. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the introduction. I hope I will live up to it, but I'm very grateful to be here. And also thank you for the questions which you posed. I had, again, they are difficult questions, and the advantage is that difficult questions don't always get answers. We can continue discussing them. But what I want to try and do is to give you what I think is happening uh, in terms of the world of heritage. And uh, I know that uh, I always want to differentiate between heritage and history because, in my view, they are different. At times we talk about them as if they are one, but uh, I think they are some very subtle uh, uh, differences. But I'm also going to do this, the work or the idea of heritage, I'm going to use it and demonstrate it through the history of Ikron and what has happened, because in my view, it has tried to follow what is happening within the field of, uh, of heritage. Uh, I think uh, some of you already know that Ikrom was formed in Delhi, in New Delhi, uh, as a result, in my view, of the destructions which had actually happened in Europe during the Second World War. So there was a need to look at the monuments and try and see how we can serve them. Uh, but there was an idea that an organization would be uh, the best thing. And that's how what was then referred to as the Rome Center was created. And again, it was uh, a few countries who joined initially, but uh, today it's uh, a big organization. These are the first countries which joined ICROM. It, well, what uh, strikes me is that it represents all the continents. Uh, although the big countries are not there, but all the continents are, are there. Even though those where the, world, the Second World War had not been fought, mm -hmm. but they realized the need for conservation of heritage. Today, ICROM exists uh, in two centers, the HQ, which is here in Rome, and we also have a regional office for a regional project in Sharjah, UAE. Today we have 137 member states, and these member states, uh, of course, they fluctuate from time to time, depending on what is happening in individual countries. At the moment, there is a, a rush within the former Soviet Union countries to join, uh, which uh, we welcome. Uh, in some ways, because we're spreading the work into those uh, uh, regions. But basically, our objective is to advance the knowledge in heritage conservation and also raise awareness amongst uh, people of the world of the importance of protecting cultural heritage. Again, I will perhaps try and show you uh, that cultural heritage has an impact in our day-to-day -day lives. And how we do that uh, may not be too obvious, but with time, uh, we can begin to see the results of what we are doing. Again, the mandate today for ICROM is to promote conservation of cultural heritage throughout the world. I think uh, with 137 member states, we are one of the fairly uh, sort of you know, middle class or middle uh, organization, not too large, not too small. So I think uh, we are beginning to reach throughout the world. Again, uh, here I'm just showing you some of the main programs which we are doing. We 
divide our programs into into basically three sections what you call the flagship pro programs and then the exploratory programs and some of the supporting programs just to mention the flagship programs the first flagship program we are implementing is what is called the world heritage leadership program and then we also have the Athar program the regional program in Sharjah which looks at the Arab region basically we also have the first aid for cultural heritage as one of our flagship and I must say that it has become quite you know a busy program throughout the world because of uh, not just conflicts but it also looks at disasters which are happening and trying to help the individual countries to uh, at least be ready for some of these disasters when they happen. The other flagship program is the Youth Heritage Program for Africa, which is the newest, which we started uh, last year. We were supposed to start in 2020, but as we all know, 2020 brought other things with it. Uh, one of the things which has uh, developed is that ICROM is not just a training center. We want to emphasize the idea of capacity building. And capacity building is not just built by bringing people and training them for two weeks or training them for three months, although that is part of it. We also have other means of building capacity. It could be through seminars. It could also be through internships. It could also be collaborative work on specific projects. Right now we have a project, a big project in Mosul, uh, which we are collaborating with UAE, UNESCO, uh, and many other countries to try and revive or to rebuild uh, Mosul. I think it's called a, a revi the revival of Mosul, uh, the project. Again, I think from the beginning, Ikrom's emphasis was on monuments and sites. It was about the fabric. If a monument dilapidates, how do we fix it? How do we mix the mortars and make sure that uh, it doesn't deteriorate? Trying to freeze time in some ways, which I think uh, naturally is not possible. Uh, it was also to look at what, how heritage could be negatively impacted, not just by the weather, but even by people. And in my own continent, uh, where you had heritage sites, people were moved out uh, in order to make sure that the sites are protected. Uh, and that was the time where what was seen to be important was the caring of the heritage itself, the monument and the site. I think from my point of view, we have moved, and this is what ICROM is also trying to do. It also moves with the definition of heritage. Instead of just looking at uh, heritage as monuments and sites, it is much more, uh, and again, with monuments and sites, is, it is more expert-driven. The expert tells us that this is your heritage. The expert tells us what is wrong with this heritage. The expert then finds solutions to this heritage. And what we are trying to do now is to try and move away from that, but to look at what at Ikrom we call the people-centered approach, which basically looks at the values which people put on the heritage. And that is what is important to be conserved. It is not just the expert. It is the expert with the owners with other interested parties who have to look at the heritage. And again, it's not just looking at the negative impacts. You also want to look at the positive impacts. If we do this, what is going to happen? Is it in, in the modern day world, you want to look at, does it bring more tourists? And if the tourists are coming, are they bringing in any money? But at the same time, as they are bringing money, what is happening to the site? You need to make sure that that is uh, covered. The whole issue is that the heritage must be seen to be useful to the community, to the country, to the people who 
own it or who are utilizing it. So the change here is instead of just caring about the heritage, we want to look at heritage as something which also uh, provides for society. It is not just looking for heritage for heritage's sake. We need to make sure that we uh, also cater for those who look after it. Again, it's more or less this, the, 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 the same idea here, that we started off by looking at heritage, the history, the materials, and, and all that. But again, it's a, it's a philosophical change. In this case, we begin to look at major things in this case. Instead of just looking at the material, you are also looking at the governance, the legislations, the capacity to do things. Also, it's not just material. Do you have the resources to make sure that this monument is not decaying? We might not want it to decay, but if we don't have resources, what are we doing? That monument could also be used for social issues, religious issues, particularly, I think, uh, again, one of the things which I always say is that within the Western world, I think industrialization has provided for what I almost term a very large middle class. But that's not the case in other continents. There is still uh, a battle to build that. The middle class is not just about wealth. In my view, it's also about knowledge and also trying to uh, make, maximize what you have. In other parts of the world, it is not uh, like that. Again, issues of economy and political. I always say heritage, whichever way you look at it, it is always political. I know experts at the time say, no, 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 I want to stay away from the politics. I think uh, you're just cheating yourself. Heritage will always be political. Even if at, at the lowest level, even just in the museum where you're working, it has political connotation. And so we need to, 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 to include that. Then there's also the natural environment. More importantly, particularly nowadays, I'll come back to this when I talk about uh, uh, the issue of climate change. But again, it's not just the practitioners. We need institutions, we need communities, we need networks, so that we all come together to look at this heritage, rather than us as experts saying, no, 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 me, you know, you can't do this, right? We have to protect it for my research. Uh, it's more than uh, that communities also have interest in what we are doing. I think here I'm just trying to uh, explain all these things which I'm saying. Uh, and also, I mean, the practical things which you want to do, the way you look at uh, issues. Uh, and again, today, the issue of sustainable development. Uh, if we don't contribute to this, uh, I think we might find ourselves irrelevant to the world's uh, goals, as it were. And now we try and, at Ikrom at least, we try and look at the goals and how cultural heritage contributes. And I think cultural heritage is the backbone of almost all the, uh, the, 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 the goals, the sustainable development goals. Of course, there are some which are specific, but if you take away culture, I think uh, you might find it difficult. I just want to mention this, because as we do things which we say this is normal, we tend also to get what I might refer to as disruptions. But those disruptions are permanent. They change the way we look at things. And I'm sure all of us are aware of COVID. Yes, it affected us in the, in the sense of the health. But it also affected the way we are doing things in heritage itself. Uh, now at Ikrom, we used to have, uh, my, my people would tell me, you can't have a, a training course without face-to-face, -face. but almost, 80% of our courses now are uh, through uh, virtual. Again, the issue of climate. We have seen the disasters. We have seen the disasters. We have seen uh, issues like that which affect us. And ICROM had a big conference, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to say, even attended by some of the UN uh, uh, major uh, players, trying to look at how can we maximum or minimize the issue of um, of, uh, uh, of of climate change again we are all aware these days 
the issue of uh, conflicts and heritage. This one is within us today. I'm just mentioning what Ikrom has been doing. We may not have been in the press, but we are working with the Ukrainians to try and help them, particularly some of the museums which have been destroyed, some of the buildings which have been destroyed. We, of course, can only operate from a distance, but that's what we can do. I just want to end up by looking at two things. One is we have to recognize who influences the way we do heritage. And there are very few countries all over the world who make the thrust in heritage. And they are the ones with the brown color, mainly Western Europe, the US. Um, of course, we do have things coming from the other different countries. But how we do heritage is influenced by those few countries. The practice of heritage basically copies standards from those uh, countries. Even the networks, uh, there are more networks between those big countries who are doing research uh, than those countries where uh, there is no research. So there is a difference in the way the world then uh, handles heritage. We can try and uh, summarize uh, and say this is heritage, but in the other parts of the world, Central Africa, for example, they are looking at it differently. I hope that with digital, maybe we'll be able to democratize heritage knowledge. But again, this is only the beginning. And perhaps thanks to COVID, we are beginning to invest much more in this than before. Again, I just want to end by saying that the basis of heritage for the future is the youth. We just have to make sure that the youth are involved. I thank you. context in which you work. So Claire is in a museum and works as in archaeology on archaeological sites. Weber, you have a background in archaeology, but now you're working in this multinational entity that's trying to really, I think of it as almost an activist agency, the way, the way you talk about it. And, and so I'm thinking about that, and then I'm thinking about this multicultural, this, this, these images you showed at the end of networks and, and connections. So I wonder if we could talk a bit about in a world in which we are more connected, but we're still rooted in this sort of Euro-based approach to thinking about how we care for monuments and sites. If we can think a little bit about, you can talk to me a bit about networks of exchange that might be productive. If there are, if, if there are actually two-way networks going say, back and forth in terms of how conservators are trained or the sorts of questions that we're asking. And I thought it was particularly interesting that ECROM was built out of these this multi-continent initiative, right? Is there something from its root that was not just centered in some sort of European concern about European monuments, but a recognition that there's something much bigger? So I wondered if you could talk about the way different, in, in terms of training conservators, the way different traditions might be coming to bear on, on practice. I, I think it's a, it's a very challenging question, training for conservators. 
I, I don't have any problem with uh, training people because this is a Western idea. I think that's the reality. Uh, we can try and invent other things, but uh, I don't think uh, uh, it's going to be now. But what is important is to say that that Western idea, how do we localize it? How do we make a person in Sri Lanka, for example, understand that some of the principles can apply to his monument? I, I think to me that's what is important. Mm -hmm. And uh, that also means multicultural training programs. I think if I might say one thing, uh, with Ikron, in the past, I think almost 90% of our programs were in Rome. Today, I'm ashamed to say it, none. Mm -hmm. They are all, all over the world. Uh, and again, it's not that we are not taking the Western experts there. We are taking them there. But also, I'm sure the Western experts will learn from these uh, courses they are conducting with uh, different uh, groups of people from different ethnic uh, backgrounds. Mm -hmm. That's a follow up, but maybe we'll turn to, I guess I wondered if you could give us a specific example of maybe a place where you've conducted a training that has helped mm, expand the ways of thinking about conservation. Is there a particular case you could share with us, whether it's about the treatment of a particular kind of material or a way of engaging with the community? Well, I mean, uh, I can give you many examples. The, the conservation of the Kasubi tombs in Uganda, for example. Uh, originally, uh, it was done by uh, Crate from France. Uh, I mean, this is a, a tomb which I searched. Uh, Originally, it was done by Crater, but they worked with uh, local communities. Uh, and now, uh, the Ugandans themselves uh, uh, do it. They don't really need the, the uh, Crater to come in and, and, and help them. Mm -hmm. right. But also, one of the things which uh, the Ugandans uh, emphasized was that they are not so much worried about the thirst. What they are more worried about is that this is the, uh, the tomb of the Kabaka, the tomb of the king, right? Krater was worried about the fish, it will catch fire, it will do that. Mm -hmm. But for them, they were saying, ah, well, if it catches fire, we'll put another one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, so there's a difference in uh, the perception. For them, the value was not in the fish. For Krater, the value was in the fish. This is the authenticity. This is the authentic material. But for, for the Bugandans, the authenticity lay in the use right. of the place. But we were able, and I'm talking about my time when I was at Ikron before, not now, to, to make them work together and begin to understand each other. Uh, instead of saying, no, 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 don't do this ritual because it will lead to a fire. You say, no, okay, what can we do to make sure that no fire right. is going to right. come out of this? So you are preserving the authenticity of the church, but you are also preserving the authenticity of the tomb as seen by the local people. Diplomacy. <laughs> it's a diplomacy. Yes. Claire, uh, okay, well, let me address um, also your question, because conservation takes place at various levels um, within our organization. Um, we're pretty fortunate in that each of the museum departments has its own um, affiliated department of conservation. So treating our objects, the specialists in antiquities in paintings, photography, works on paper and all of that. Um, but we're also you know, particularly lucky um, at the villa because it also um, houses the Getty um, uh, at UCLA conservation um, master's and PhD program, which has a base at our site as well as at UCLA. I'm sorry that my colleague um, Ellen Perlstein, who's also a, a, a fellow this year, is, is on the road because she heads it. Um, so, but it's where it's particularly, you know, great opportunity for students and for us. But apart from that, um, you know, there is also another program of the Getty, the Getty Conservation Institute, and that is conducting, um, you know, scientific research, environmental research, policy development, 
um, very targeted projects, a lot of training, and and those kinds of um, initiatives around the world um, in a very specific way. And I think Weber, over the years, they've, they've collaborated regularly um, with, with ECROM. So, but for us in the museum, you know, I can honestly say that conservation is probably, to me, one of the most important things that we do. Our relationships um, with other countries are pivoting um, on this kind of collaboration, of sharing, of working together on objects um, to study, to analyze. We have pretty, um, pretty excellent um, instrumentation, scientific labs, so we can do things together um, and work on objects together, bring them over, um, treat them, display them for the public, and then send them back you know, with a, a sort of joint research, joint publications, and a new um, way to re um, uh, display them in their home countries, home mm -hmm. museums. So mm -hmm. that I think is a really um, vitally important aspect of cultural diplomacy. And we're also doing just independent um, scientific research of our own. If an issue will come up, we want to, curators want to know <laughs> the answer. We have issues um, that affect us as much as other countries. So we've been I think, very active, for example, in seismic stabilization, protection of collections in museums in, in earthquake um, risk zones through the cre uh, creation of, of special mounts and platforms that will protect statues. So that work has gone on with in collaboration with Palermo, with Athens, and with others. So there's just, there's a huge amount going on on many interlinking um, levels. And you know, to be honest, I, I couldn't actually imagine doing any part of my job without Kaserver right there, right, right next to me. I appreciate you speaking on the behalf of conservators because I know I'm, you're not a conservator, I'm not. so I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of a beneficiary. Put Claire on the spot a little bit, but um, you raised a question. This is a huge question, and I I, I just want to ask it because I I I think there are many directions it could go in, but it's this question of the quantity of things out there that we might want to save or or reconstitute or continue to use. And I'm thinking, again, about these different contexts, and if you could talk, each of you, a bit about how you make the decision, right? You can't conserve everything. So, and you talked about experts. So maybe you could talk, maybe we can start with you, Claire, about when you're faced with those sorts of choices, resources, and, and who are the stakeholders that you go to in your case? And maybe I'd like to know, on your end, how you decide where you're going to put your resources. Well, some of the, you know, the really major works that came to us, it was, it was definitely a process of uh, negotiation and talking. We have an idea, you know, especially when it comes to an exhibition, um, there may be some very key objects, but it's not safe for them to travel, or they are essential in some way. So you enter into a dialogue and a discussion, what could work for all, what could be a, you know, an outcome that everybody would gain something for. So something from. So, you know, we've had, the, as I said, the, the lion and horse uh, came, but that work on that treatment was done here beforehand um, to stabilize it for travel and to understand it a little bit better after 700 years. Um, and, but other works, uh, you know, major works, the Chimera of Arezzo, uh, bronzes, especially um, from the Museo Archeologico in Naples, you know, we talk together and get a pretty good idea of what could be valuable, what really is an urgent research question a that needs scientific analysis that will add value not only to the object but to the, to the collection and to the understanding of the whole field. And it's kind of cumulative. Um, you know, we start on some bronzes, we're going to continue with bronzes, understanding techniques from the 18th century, 19th century, mm -hmm. what's happened, mm -hmm. um, so, it's, so that it builds on itself and it generates some, some real um, research and scientific momentum. Mm -hmm. So really, mm -hmm. it's extremely interesting. So it's team-based within your... Yes, I would say, for sure. Yeah, yeah I think uh, team building is uh, an important issue, but I would, again, maybe I haven't worked in a museum, uh, for a long time, but it might be easier within within the museum uh, in terms of the stakeholders or the people. But it's also very complex when you are outside. I'm sure some of you have read about the sort of Angkor Wat, mm -hmm. where us as experts said, okay, we want to restore this building. 
because these are the issues. The community saying, wow, well, well, you know, so what are we going to do with our religion? Okay, we move them out. After five years, they built another wonderful Angkor Wat uh, besides this one, right? Because they wanted the, the, to continue their religion. And when we finished and said, yeah, yeah, but you can go back, said, no, 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 we have uh, a new one. They had even bought plastic things from the U.S. to put, <laughs> you know, and they said, no, no, no. You know. So I'm, I'm just saying it's, 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 it's not an easy uh, situation, particularly when you're dealing with monuments or huge sites where there are different uh, values which different stakeholders are, are, are putting. But I think there's nothing which can stop us from trying to be diplomatic and trying to get everyone together. Because if we don't do that, then now, we, like what I'm saying, they build something just, well, it's not even more than five kilometers from there. You already have something on the landscape is affecting the main one. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'm just saying we need to be able to, if we are to avoid such situations, we need to be able to invest time in, we as experts, in convincing the others that this is what is required. I think we cannot take our, 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 ourselves away and say, oh, well, this is what the community wants. Uh, it, we, we need to inform them why uh, we have to do it this way rather than just doing what they're doing. Yeah. That sounds delicate, though. You, you, yes. And you have to people on the ground that are yeah. facilitating. Um, this is fascinating, and I think um, I want to make sure we do have time for audience questions. So I'm going to solicit those if anyone has a question. Um, our room is equipped so you don't need to go to a microphone, you just need to raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, and then maybe just stand up. Um, Ashley, I think. Ashley. Hi there. I'm interested in uh, asking you to pick at the question of ruins um, as an evocative metaphor and also as political. I'm interested in how we might use and when I say we, I mean the people interested in heritage, but how we might use ruins and uh, physical fabric as um, a provocation to confront some of our most urgent questions to be more future-oriented, things like climate change. How can we use these vestiges to be really future-oriented in our planning and our thinking? Yeah, I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> There will always be ruins, and uh, in as much, and that's my view, in as much as we might want to freeze them, they will always change, and uh, with climate change, what we can do is try and slow down the change. Uh, I think it's a discussion, we are also involved with uh, Notre Dame, it's a discussion which is going on, <coughs> uh, whether uh, we should put in new material, uh, but if we don't put new materials, then we're going to have the roof of the Notre Dame. So we have to get new wood to come in and, 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 and put it in. <coughs> and some people argue that, look, I mean, from the excavations they've done, that it has always been changing. It's almost like every generation, uh, even though they are ruins, they still write their story on those rules. So what is the story which this current generation is writing on those rules? Uh, I know that we, and I'm sorry if uh, I offend anybody, I, I know that we, we at times get obsessed with authenticity. Uh, but I think uh, at times, we have to realize that things change. Mm -hmm. In any environment, things will change. But if they are out there as, as, as rules, uh, in my view, they will always uh, change. Of course, the, you mentioned the political side. I, I don't want to go there. But, uh, I think, in, in my view, rules will always change. But the issue is how do we retard uh, that change? I think of several projects in which um, 
know, the environmental issues were really front and center um, in the Conservation Institute's work in Herculaneum in the House of the Bi Bi uh, Bicentennial. Bicentennial um, you know, the question of the incursion of, of um, humidity and water um, was was a was a major issue on the impact on the on walls and on frescoes that had to be developed. Um, the impact of just the human presence inside of the um, the Egyptian tombs um, and the humidity the you know um, that was affecting um, flora on the interior. So all of those kind of qualities, all of those um, issues, I think are taken into account in the design of projects, and they generate a great deal of information that will be relevant um, to other, other structures, other sites, um, and you know, for, the, for the future, I mentioned the most drastic one, of course, with earthquakes, but um, you know, there is so much. Um, just the, the mere um, pollution, air pollution that affects not only all the outdoor monuments here, but interior, internal um, gallery conditions are um, serious, so that's been a major initiative. So e in each, in so many different ways, that, that is really important. And um, hopefully that knowledge, um, the scientific knowledge that is generated can be applied to other, to other cases. I'm going to give a plug to the project of our fellow Sarah Nunberg, who's here working on a carbon calculator, and she's trying to um, and she's made, she's made a tool, Sarah's here, that helps conservators understand you know, what they're producing that is further eroding the environment. So and on a small scale or a really big scale. So, and I think that's Sarah in the back with her hand, so please. Thank you. Um, as a conservator, I, uh, uh, and with my work, um, the longer I do treatment, and the more I consider climate change and the impact of our treatments and the impact of everything we're, we're doing on the environment, I think more and more about time. And well, you mentioned time quite a bit. Both of you actually did in different ways. And I'm wondering if, I, if either of you have, with climate change and also with moving on in your experiences in your career, um, have begun to view time differently. And um, or, or reconsider our work in terms of the, the length of its duration. Um, I say this in terms of when I'm looking at impact of materials we use, um, engineers think of time as shorter than we do. Because when we do a treatment, we think it's going to last forever. And that term forever now has really um, come to question for me, especially in terms of the impact of my work. And I'm wondering if either of you have had thoughts about that and can tell me more about that. Well, I think of, I feel the passage of time really urgently every time you step into a storeroom of a museum and then you observe, you know, treatments that perhaps are only 25 years old and yet the materials, um, adhesives that were used are disintegrating and, you know, nothing, I'd like to, oh, it's for sure, nothing bad happens on our account but an earlier restoration, you know, can snap. Um, so that, you know, that is really urgent. And when you think of how many, um, you know, decaying, at-risk objects there are, um, in not even in the you know, climate control circumstances <coughs> in which we keep them, um, to me it feels like a very pressing um, issue to try to address what we can and to as you were saying, help to build the capacity that local um, local workers and specialists are, are better able to care for this. Um, we're, we're privileged, but um, there's a great deal to do. So, Does that get at your actual question? I, I know it's a vague question, and I, I know from myself as a professional, my, I just constantly am coming up against what is the time that we're talking about, because as conservators, yeah, it's something maybe on your shelf that's been in here yesterday. What, how long is that going to last, 20 years? Mm -hmm. but, you know, we teach students that we're looking at things reversible forever. Mm -hmm. It's not. Mm -hmm. So there's a new, and I think that there's a newness in it, in our, in our work now with climate change. Uh, I, I think uh, 
again, like I said, it's now. Uh, because we are looking at this thing now with the technology of now, what we can do now. And we always, I think uh, my experience has been, we always think, oh, what? Why, why did they use this? What were they thinking? Uh, at that time, maybe that was the technology. Uh, and I know that we always work like, okay, I am the solution. I'm, this is going to be permanent. But I think perhaps to be human by saying, well, at the moment, this is the best solution I have. Mm. Right? I'm not doing something permanent, but at least it can conserve this for now. And this is the best method that I have. Yeah. We don't know what happens in the next 10, 20 years. Other methods might come up. But I, I think, in my view, as long as we recognize the fact that we are doing it for now, and this is the best we can do, uh, and it's not uh, that it's permanent, because, uh, again, yeah, we do come uh, at times, but very rarely, where we say, oh, this was brilliantly done 20 years ago. We, rarely we do, we do we say so. We always say, no, we don't know. why were they using this material? We put it, you know. But we forget that at that time, this was what was there, and that was the knowledge. And again, today we have that knowledge, but the knowledge is changing, right? And so we treat the thing with what with the best we have uh, until maybe it might be for another ten years, or even next year somebody comes and says, "Oh, I'm going to change." It seems another way of thinking about this. We were talking about this a little bit is how you might. And you see this in Italy quite a bit, how you show different moments in the mm. time of an object. So you don't pretend that you're going to make it look mm. like this, or you erase the histories of intervention, but you show those. And so the thing kind of has a life and time that's evident. And that's something I appreciate as a, a viewer of objects who's interested in what happens to them all the time. So that might be another way of framing time and, and the material. The material that seems to want to be fixed, right? But as you're saying, it just isn't. Yvonne. Good evening. So this question is rooted in, in my recent experience researching in Poland, as well as, as doing uh, heritage man management in what used to be southern ancient Etruria, and which is now northern Lazio. So both of these areas are, I'd say, afflicted by fascist uh, nostalgia. And so, I'd like to combine two questions. First, Claire is, Claire is a question, how can we democratize the object and interest in heritage, heritage conservation? Um, in, in my anecdotal experience, on the one hand, government officials and grassroots associations are often attached to triumphal narratives. It remains difficult to recount anything but the monumental. Democratic values disrupt established symbols of power, like the Roman Forum, and perhaps also the Yukasubi trees in Uganda. These monuments do not represent democracy. Thinking about Weber's comment about informing communities, what strategies have you successfully adopted to mediate between stories of glory and difficult heritage? That is, that is a good question. That is a, a challenging question. Um, if I look across the entire, just from our perspective, if I look across, you know, the range of objects that have come through, um, you know, yes, there are the, you know, the spectacular, um, which are at the center of any museum here, um, because um, I think it's um, democratic that people in many places should understand, hopefully appreciate, and be really interested in works that they might not themselves have the chance um, to see and to experience. They may not be able to travel, but I know that they appreciate it. We did a, uh, a major exhibition um, for the bicentennial of, of Mexican independence and brought a number of works of Aztec art to Los Angeles, to the villa. That was um, you know, a little ironic since we're a museum of you know, ancient Greek and Roman art, but we made it work, I could tell you about that. Um, Later, but the chance um, to see, you know, stellar objects that appear on currency, 
are so important to so many people and to bring them to a place where families and second generations may never have been able to go back and see them in, purpose, uh, in person, you know, I think that's, I think that's important. So, uh, of course, you know, major excavations, major restoration works often, you know, do, um, do focus on, you know, monuments of certain historical eras and regimes. As I tried to say in my talk, you know, even those kind of sites are palimpsests and, you know, repositories for so many different kinds of values and chapters of history and interactions of emotional experience. And that's something that maybe I didn't um, dwell on enough, which is the fact that it's not just the materiality of these monuments and their you know, historical moment in a certain period, some of which are, are unpleasant mm -hmm. historical periods, but it's these intangible values. Mm -hmm. How do we, you know, understand the intel intangible values? How do we invite multiple, you know, responses and ideas about what is important? And, and how do we, um, you know, capture, even if they're conflicting narratives? And that, that's what I think is really challenging and really interesting. I know we're focused on materiality, we have to be, but what's behind that um, is very much more complicated. So I, does that, I hope maybe that addresses some of your issues. Mm -hmm. I still have to dwell on the mm -hmm. idea of fascist Etruria. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's uh, <it's> there. <laughs> Do you have a separate question that you wanted, uh, well, you know, we're hoping I'm, whoever would. I'm interested in this, in this conflict, which is not, this is not a Western problem. Um, maybe it's more of an urban-rural problem, but I find that in many places people are really attached to stories of grandeur. Um, and how do you reconcile those values with democracy, participation, and inclusion, accessibility? When people want to be great, they want their turn on the pedestal. I think I, I, I said at some point that uh, heritage is always political. Yeah. In as much as we might uh, try and say, okay, you know, scientific. Um, I don't know about democratization. Yeah. People always want to use, whether they are local communities or who, they always want to, to want to use heritage to their advantage. Mm -hmm. But the, the issue is how do we reconcile the, this with trying to preserve or make sure that the head of the is protected. Because from our point of view as experts, what we're trying to do is to protect the heritage. Uh, we engage in the democratic processes and all that, but our focus is on the, on the heritage. On the other hand, they come into the heritage with different uh, baggage, if you want to call it, different interests. Uh, they may not necessarily see anything of value in the monument itself, but maybe they want to use it if you want to be at a national level, maybe it's something to do with power and issues like that. So I'm, I'm, not, so sure, I'm not convinced, if I might put it that way, that we can democratize mm -hmm. uh, things that we are on a heritage which is uh, conflictual, where there are uh, conflicting ideas and issues. Uh, I mean, when we say democratize, what do we mean? We say if, it, if it's 50% or 51% or 49 no. Uh, I, I think we have to keep on negotiating to the, to the extent that it preserves the heritage, in my view. Uh, otherwise, everyone comes in with certain interests. Thank you. I'd like to take one more question, Sonita, in the back, and then... I think this well. follows on the question that was just asked. I appreciate the connection of ethics, politics, and democracy, so I want to ask a two-part question and your personal opinions about, on the one hand, the um, bringing down of monuments like Confederate statues, or the splashing of red paint on King Leopold statues in Belgium, or the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddha statues, right? That's, all, that's one political arena of the preservation or the uh, deliberate destruction of some people's heritage, right? 
And then on the side of democracy, have you had any conversations with local people living around heritage sites and whose ancestors were the bricklayers or the stonemasons or the people who cooked the food for the people who constructed those places? The White House was made by enslaved peoples who were recorded, uh, right, and given pennies a day uh, to uh, build the White House, right, or the pyramids, for example. So I'm thinking of that as a democratic act of acknowledging the people who actually made those monuments and who have an investment of current, current population around those sites, their ancestors were the actual builders of those monuments. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. I mean, uh, you mentioned the issues of statues and all that. Um, my, my own views are that uh, These, are these statues representing the common uh, aspirations? Like what I said, you know, heritage is something which we use today. It's not what happened in the past, uh, in as much as we try and use the past to justify it. Uh, I can mention like the, the statues of Rhodes in Cape Town and all that. I, I feel that uh, it may not be appropriate, even if we force them to look after the statue, but for what reason? We are not saying that we are erasing history. Again, I want to differentiate between heritage and history. Uh, heritage is what you want to do today rather than, uh, rather than in, in the past. I think, again, with the Bamian uh, I mean, it, it depends on who you talk to. Uh, and, and who is sort of championing what side. Uh, and of course, we want to make sure that everybody is, 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 is represented. But uh, at times, the, the voices which come up may not necessarily be the majority of voices. The people who destroy the statues might just be the few radical uh, people. They might be on the right side of history, but it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, everyone wants them to do so. So it's a tricky question. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure I can give you a very straightforward answer to that. Well, I, I, it's not my particular field, but I know that those you know, archaeologists and conservators who work um, with materials for which there is a direct and close descendant community, I think would make it a regular practice to work very um, intimately with those communities and with representatives in the American uh, West um, in um, <coughs> of, um, some of the materials that came um, out of Ethiopia and the involve, involvement of Ethiopian communities in um, you know, understanding the proper way, the most proper and respectful way to handle and store um, sacred objects. So I think that the, those are um, fairly um, common practice is just that, you know, in many of our cases, um, you know, Etruria, you know, they, people care, but, but they, I don't think they see direct ancestral um, lineage um, in many cases, you know, especially in my field work in Sicily, um, you know, and I did, I studied um, tombs and burials, I was a cemetery archaeologist, there isn't that ancestral sense of pre-Christian communities as directly related. Just interesting, but not, not related. So I think it's very selective, and it depends very much on the culture um, and the particular um, you know, experiences and histories that, that they have uh, witnessed. Thank you. I, I think this was a nice place to conclude, because we've talked about materials that come and go. And I think your question and the, the notion of heritage and history shows us that even time is something that comes and goes, and so we're in this constant state of redefining the materiality, but also the sort of temporality of the things that surround us and the way we relate to them. So um, I want to invite you all upstairs. We have a reception. I think the exhibition, Regeneration, is open until 8 p.m., and the reception is conveniently located adjacent to the exhibition, so although I think drinks are supposed to stay out, I hope you'll see it if you have not already, and I want to thank
uh, Weber and Doro and Claire Lyons for their very thoughtful and inspiring. Thank you.